One of the major functions of the immune system is not defense, but managing the microbiota. And the microbiota are then co-evolving with their management by the immune system, just as they co-evolve with the defense function of the immune system. This happens particularly in the gut and on the skin. And we also can see what would happen if there had not been any coevolution by considering the example of Rinderpest. So our commensal microbiota is immense. Each of us contains over a thousand species of bacteria and an unknown and astronomically large number of viruses. These microorganisms do not normally cause disease in a healthy host. Some of them can do so in an immunocompromised host if they change niche. Pathogens represent only a tiny fraction of the microbes that colonize us. And many of the commensal microbes are providing us with essential benefits. They produce vitamins, they help us digest complex polysaccharides, they detoxify harmful chemicals, they compete with pathogens for intestinal niches, and they provide the stimulation necessary for proper maturation of the immune system. So how are they managed? They're managed by our immune system. We can see this in immunocompromised individuals who suffer from infections that are commonly caused by the same microorganisms that are normally harmless in immune competent people. The immune system is thus operating both to remove pathogens, but also to maintain host microbe homeostasis. It does so by controlling the growth and invasion of commensal microbes that can cause disease in, immu in immunocompromised states. These are the opportunistic or endogenous pathogens. The action is actually most intense at epithelial interfaces in the epithelial mu mucosae, where our need for access, access to oxygen and to nutrients opens up doors that microbes can enter. So that is where the management needs to be the most careful. We do produce some natural probiotics to help manage the microbiota. Human milk oligosaccharides are the third most abundant component of breast milk. When Bifidobacterium longum infantis is grown on human milk oligosaccharides, it adheres better to human intestinal epithelial cells, and there it induces greater expression of anti-inflammatory cytokine, IL-10, and junctional adhesion molecules than do control strains that are grown on lactose. So the kind of oligosaccharide provided by human breast milk appears to have been designed by evolution specifically to promote the growth of a particular member of the microbiota. Thus the host is encouraging the colonization of infant gut by a beneficial bacterium. Let's take a look at the gut ecosystem. In this left panel we have a healthy gut environment and in the right panel, we have an altered gut environment. In the healthy gut environment, out in the gut lumen, we have a mixture of peacekeeping bacteria and pathogens. We have a healthy epithelial barrier, and behind that epithelial barrier, we have T cells of various types, and we have then the lamina propria, which is also a mechanical barrier. In an altered gut environment, we have a damaged epithelial barrier that allows increased bacterial adherence and penetration because normally the bacteria can't get through the mucus to get that close to the epithelium. And if the bacteria can get through the barrier, they produce pathological inflammation. So in the healthy gut, the immune system is maintaining the microbes as commensals out in the lumen. And in the altered gut, the defenses have been breached and immune activation leads to inflammation and infection can follow. Both genes and environment are contributing to this. So there are genes where mutations in particular receptors, such as the Nod receptor, uh, make this kind of breaching of the barrier more likely. And 
stress diet and uh, vaccines possibly and in, uh, infections are all things that can contribute as well. So it's a gene environment interaction. Similarly with the skin. <clears throat> in the healthy skin ecosystem, we have the epidermis. Of course, there are things that breach the epidermis. There are sweat glands and hair follicles, so those are paths of entry. Living on the epidermis are fungi, bacteria, and viruses that are also living in the hair follicles. They are communicating below the, below the epidermis and dermis with macrophages and with dendritic cells. And these are sending out signals which are generating antimicrobial defenses. So there are antimicrobial peptides that are also out there on the surface of the skin that are being made by the immune system. So in the healthy skin, the microbiota are in conversation with the immune system. They promote immunity by activating lymphocytes. And to visualize the scale of this, the healthy human skin contains about 20 billion lymphocytes with a huge population of memory T cells. There are at least five mechanisms that microbiota can use in causing a skin disorder. One is if there is a genetic predisposition in the host, so there might be a barrier defect or some defect in a regulatory pathway. Another is an increase in general microbial density that can happen with a metabolic disease or with something like acne. Another is a shift in context, so a pathogen that would cause damage only when the skin barrier is breached. That would be something like Staphylococcus aureus or Candida albicans. They're living there on the skin most of the time and they aren't causing us any problem unless there's a break in the barrier. Other pathogens can infect and open uh, a pathway for our skin microbiota to get through. And there can also be increases of defined bacteria. So for example, Staph aureus can increase, uh, particularly if it's a multiply resistant Staph aureus. So psoriasis, dermatitis, and acne are all diseases that result from disturbance of the skin ecosystem. It's a complex ecosystem normally managed by crosstalk with the immune system. Now, extrinsic and intrinsic virulence are concepts that crop up in this context as well. Many pathogens are harmless in their normal hosts, but highly virulent in accidental hosts. These are the spillover ones. Their virulence is extrinsic because it depends on the environment in which they find themselves. In contrast to that, intrinsic virulence is defined by the possession by the pathogen of genes that make it more virulent in a naive host than related microbes that lack those genes. So a good example would be the genes that mediate the production of the toxins that cause either diphtheria or tetanus. So here is a painting of a person who is having a, tet a tetanus convulsion and is absolutely rigid. Extrinsic and intrinsic virulence are often difficult to separate. They are the best analyzed in cases like myxomatosis, which we saw, the virus infecting Australian rabbits, in which scientists can set aside both the virus and the rabbit and thereby study changes in host and in pathogen in a controlled, comparative fashion. Resistance and tolerance in the host are also critical. Pathogens can evolve to be less virulent, but hosts can also evolve to be more tolerant or more resistant. Both are often happening at the same time. Either way, a symbiotic relationship can be established. So a destructive relationship can be potentially converted into a non-destructive relationship by evolution. However, the resulting intrinsic virulence of the symbionts is very different in these two cases, and it has important consequences for naive hosts who lack that coevolutionary history. These consequences played out dramatically in the introduction of rinderpest from Eurasia 
to Africa. So we're now going to take a look at a case in which an entire continent was naive. This is, a, this is an infected piece of tissue that has rinderpest in it. This is a pathogen that was native to the Eurasian continent and was introduced to Africa. It's a virus. It attacks buffalo, cattle, eland, kudu, giraffe, bushbuck, warthogs, and bush pigs. So it's attacking ungulates. It's endemic to the Asian steppes, and it was repeatedly introduced to Europe through human invasions, where it did cause some problems. It entered Italian Somaliland either in cattle imported from Asia in 1889 or in Russian cattle with the relief of General Gordon in Khartoum in 1884, so late 19th century. By 1890, it crossed the Sahara and it spread into populations that had no evolved resistance. There were some direct consequences. It spread over eastern, central, and southern Africa between 1890 and 1899. There it eliminated most domestic cattle and wild buffalo and many of the related bovids. One species of antelope went extinct, and the distributions of the other species remain altered to this day. The pastoral and nomadic peoples lost their food sources and then, under the stress of starvation, the human population suffered an outbreak of endemic smallpox. There were subsequent epizootics in 1917 and 18, in 1923, and in 1938 to 41. There were also indirect consequences. Over much of that infected area, tsetse flies disappeared after the epidemic because the population's wild ungulates on whose blood they fed had been killed by rinderpest. Those flies require trees and bushes as their habitat and those herbivores for their food. The disappearance of game caused the appearance of man-eating lions. In Uganda in the 1920s, there was a lion that killed 84 people. It was starving because rinderpest had killed its natural prey. And the presence of man-eating lions caused the farmers to abandon large areas in which thickets of brush then grew up. The wild ungulates developed immunity to rinderpest, moved back into the abandoned farming areas where they became hosts for the tsetse flies. The tsetse flies could now live in the new thickets of brush and on the wild ungulates. Because the tsetse flies transmit sleeping sickness, the human population then withdrew further and remained absent even after the lions had switched back to eating ungulates. So the humans avoided those areas because sleeping sickness is an extremely serious illness. Some of those areas then became the national parks of East Africa. So to summarize rinderpest, it changed the ecological structure of half a continent for at least a century. The consequences for humans were drastic they were often indirect, and they were predictable only in retrospect. It did to African ungulates what measles and smallpox did to New World humans when they were introduced by European colonists. And it has fortunately recently been eliminated by a vaccination campaign. However, it gives you some idea of what happens when a pathogen can encounter immune systems that have not co-evolved with it. So to summarize, the immune system not only defends against pathogens, it helps to manage the microbiome. Long coevolutionary interactions between humans and their microbiota have produced precise physiological mechanisms that foster a symbiotic relationship. Virulence is the product of a host pathogen interaction that has components contributed by both the host and by the pathogen. We see the consequences of host pathogen coevolution most clearly when they have not occurred. And that was the case with rinderpest in Africa, a complete disaster.